Uh, so we said we're going to try to build up calculus this semester. Um, we're going to be looking at proving a lot of the basic theorems from calculus. Uh, so today we're going to focus on one uh, really common proof technique, uh, mathematical induction. Some of you may have seen, some of you may have not. Um, it's basically a mathematical version of knocking dominoes down. Uh, so that's where we're going today. And it'll be, we'll introduce the idea and then try to do as, as many examples as we have time for. Okay, so this is, I think, section 1.2 of the book, Mathematical Induction. Okay, so this, this is a game. A lot of times as mathematicians, we're, we're greedy in what we want to know and what we want to be able to prove. And sometimes we're given an infinite number of different statements and we want to prove that they're all true. But we don't have time to check all of them, of course. So we need to do something clever. And this is where mathematical induction comes in. And it's going to let us do something clever to prove an infinite number of claims all in basically one shot. Uh, so let me start with uh, an example of where you might use this. I'm not going to go through the whole exercise of this, but just try to motivate things a little bit with something you've seen before. Uh, you've seen Newton's method before. right? You have some nonlinear equation or system of nonlinear equations that you're trying to solve. So we want to solve something of the form f of x equal to 0. This is what basically all applied math comes down to. You go into whatever your favorite problem is, you model it, you write down an equation, and then you have to find a way to solve an equation. And Newton's method is one great way to do it. So what do we do? We do some kind of iteration like this. We start with an initial guess. Then we say xn plus 1 equals xn minus f of xn divided by f prime of xn. OK, that's great, but does it work? Right? It'll compute lots of different values for us, but are those values going to be reasonable? Or are they going to get close to the value that we actually want? Uh, we don't know. It's hard to say. So this is where we want to do some analysis, some, some calculus on this, if you will, to try to prove that as we take more and more steps of this, the result we get is closer and closer to the actual solution that we're looking for. So how do we do this? Um, one way to do this, uh, there's a few steps involved. I'm not going to go through all the steps, at least not at this point. Um, we may come back to this later, depending on if we have time. Uh, so we want, to, we want to show that, basically, that the limit as n goes to infinity of xn equals, say, x star, right? where x star is actually the thing we're after. So what we need to start by doing is start by saying we can control what happens in this iteration. We need to make sure that as we take steps, things aren't bouncing too far away from where we're trying to go. And that's something that can happen in some cases. So we need to try to control the values of xn. So this would be a typical first step in a proof of Newton's method. You'd start by saying, I have some interval, a to b, and I have x0 living in this interval. And as a first step, you want to show that as you iterate, you don't wander outside of this interval. So first step, uh, if I go lower, can you still see? Maybe not. So as a first step, try to prove that all the values, right, we can iterate this as long as we want. In practice, we're going to stop at some point, but we can keep going as far as we want. And we want to prove that all of these values of xn stay in this same interval a to b, that, that somehow this iteration keeps things under control. And then there's more steps beyond that to show not only do they stay in the interval, they actually converge in on what you want. But this is typically one of the key pieces of information that you need. And you want to show that this is true for all values of n in the natural numbers. You want to know that it's true for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And again, we don't have time to check all of them. We need to somehow do this in one shot. Uh, and mathematical induction is the tool that we would use to do this. So mathematical induction. lets us prove this 
for all the values of n. So infinitely many cases. Okay, and then this would be a key key step in actually proving that you compute the thing that you want to compute. Right? This is just a motivating example. Most of the examples we're going to do are toy examples, right? Where you might say, when am I ever going to use this? Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Uh, but I do want to make it clear that this is actually important. If you're a mathematician, if you're an engineer, if you're a scientist, you need to solve equations like this. You need to be able to set up the problem in a way that you know you're going to be able to compute the right solution. And this is what's happening in the background with the mathematics. OK, so we want to build a technique for proving infinitely many things like this. We're going to start by one more assumption, one more sort of obvious claim that we're just we're not going to prove. We're just going to assume it works. So this new axiom is called the well-ordering principle. OK, so we're starting with the natural numbers, right? These are the positive whole numbers, n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Uh, and this is what it says. We take any subset of those, so any collection of natural numbers. It might be just a few of them. It might be all of them or some subset of them, infinitely many, finitely many, I don't know, uh, as long as it's not empty. So there's at least one element in this thing. OK, and all this says is of all the elements in this set, one of them is smaller than all the others. OK, so then S has a smallest element. OK, I'm, none of you look too shocked or horrified at this. Are we willing to take this as an assumption? That if I have a collection of positive whole numbers, one of them is the smallest. If one is in the set, then one is in the smallest. If it's not, then we try two. If two isn't in the set, then we try three. Eventually, we're going to come up to one that's smaller than everything in the set. The set does not have to be finite. right? So for example, I could take the set of all odd numbers. right? S equals 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on. This is our smallest element. The lower bound. It's, it's the lower bound. It's the minimum of all elements in this set. So it's actually a hard minimum. There may not be a maximum, right? These could go off to infinity, but there's always a minimum. OK, so this is the key that we need actually to make mathematical induction work. So this is where we're going to start. We're going to start up with a claim about a general natural number, right? So my claim might be that for all n, xn belongs to this interval. So I'm going to give this claim a name. I'm going to call it p of n. So let's start with a claim that I call p of n about a general natural number. OK, so for example, if I put 5 in here, p of 5 would be the claim that x5 lives in this interval. right? p100 would be the claim that x100 lives in this interval. And now what we want to do is we want to show that p of n is a true claim, a true statement for all values of n. Right? So here would be a simpler example, one that we can prove in a minute. So p of n, let me use a colon here. P of n is a truth statement, truth claim. A truth claim may be true or it may be false. That's what we have to decide. It's the claim that if you add up the first n whole numbers, then the result should be equal to 1 half of n times n plus 1. Okay, so if you want to add up the first 1,000 whole numbers, you could do it. It would take a little while. Or you could just plug 1,000 into this formula on the right 
and you'd get your sum right off the bat. That's the claim. Well, we haven't proved that yet, but that's the claim. And we want to prove this works no matter how big n is. Okay, so we have to check it for all values. So we're going to start like dominoes. The idea of this is going to be, we start by saying this works for p for n equals 1. That's the first domino. And then we, start by, and then we finish by saying, if one domino falls, if it works for n equals k, then it also has to work for the next value of n. So if it works for n equals 1, it will automatically work for n equals 2. If it works for n equals 2, automatically works for n equals 3. If it works for n equals a generic value k, it automatically works for k plus 1. All right, so these different values of n are like dominoes that hit each other. This one is true, knocks the next one down and makes it be true. This one is true, it continues and knocks the next one down. As long as we can knock down n equals 1 and prove that's true, this is going to work. So this is mathematical induction. Let's write it a little bit more precisely. OK, so let's let p of n be a statement, some kind of truth claim about uh, natural numbers, positive whole numbers. And we're going to suppose that both of these things are true. Okay, so at 1, I said we better be able to knock down the first domino. That is, when n equals 1, this statement better be true. So we have to assume that p of 1 is true. And this is called the base step. <coughs> and then secondly, we have to prove that each value of n knocks down the next value of n. So what we have to try to show is that for any value of k, if p of k is true, then automatically p of k plus 1 has to be true. Okay, this is called the induction step. Does this look reasonable? Uh, oh, oh, let me just pause. Are, are you tracking with me? Do you at least understand what this theorem is trying to say? We're definitely going to do examples of how to work this out. Um, and I'm also not saying if you believe it at this point, we're going to actually try to prove that this works. Okay? So this, we decided something like this was simple enough. We were going to assume it's true. This is a little more complicated. It's talking about what's going on with infinitely many things. We're going to actually do a proof of this. Um, and it'll be a, a nice illustration of another common proof technique that we're going to use a lot this semester. Okay, and the proof technique is called proof by contradiction. Have we seen proof by contradiction at all? Yeah, a lot of us have. Okay, great. If you haven't, this is the game. So we want to use proof by contradiction. <coughs> And what are we going to do? We're going to assume the hypotheses are true. So we're going to assume both of these are true. And we're going to assume that, nevertheless, ah, I missed the conclusion step here, then p of n is true. That's important. So we're going to assume both of these are true. And we're going to assume that even though these are true, somehow we don't get our conclusion. We can find a value where p of n is not true. Okay, and we're going to show that all of those together just lead us to absurdity, lead us to a contradiction. Okay, so we're going to assume the hypotheses are true. So A and B are true. And we're going to assume the conclusion is false. So if the conclusion is false, right? the conclusion says that p of n is always true, 
If this is false, that means we can find a value of n where it's actually not true. Okay? So that is, there exists some n such that p of n is false. And we're going to try to show that this is ridiculous, that you can't have both of these things at the same time. right? Either this is wrong or this is wrong. If we know this is right, then this is wrong. Okay? It's going to lead us to a contradiction. So this is our goal. Try to derive a contradiction. Okay, so we've assumed that somewhere along the way, right, we've got to bring this assumption in here, we've assumed that somewhere along the way we found a value that makes this false. At least one. Maybe there's more than one. But I'm going to take all the values that make this claim false and I'm going to stick them in a set. So let's collect all the values of n. That make p of n false. Okay, I'm going to create a set. n belong to n such that p of n is false. Okay, so if p of 5 happens to be false, then n equals 5 will live in this set. If p of 26 happens to be false, 26 will live in this set. All right. There might be just one element in here. There might be a whole lot in here. I'm not sure, but we know there's at least one because we've assumed here that there's at least one. So again, this is a non-empty set. I don't know how big it is, but it has an element in it. We've assumed that. This is non-empty. And it's a subset of the natural numbers, right? Everything in here is a natural number. So we said before, we're willing to make some assumption about non-empty subsets of natural numbers, right? We wrote down this axiom, the well-ordering principle, that says there should be a smallest number of this set, right? Maybe, and me of P, maybe P of 1 is true, maybe P of 2 is true, maybe P of 3 is true, but at some time, point we're going to find the first element that makes this thing false. So we've got definitely a least element. So by the well-ordering principle, S has a smallest element. And I'm going to call this M. All right, now we've got to try to figure out what we can learn about M. Is M equal to 1? No, it's not, right? We've assumed P of 1 is true. Right? So p of 1 is true. That means n equals 1 does not live in this set. So this was our first question. Was m equals 1? And the answer was no. Because of hypothesis A, p of 1 is true. OK, so m is bigger than 1. You agree? m is bigger than 1? What's that? At the top? Yeah. How, how high can you actually see on here? Two. Until about here? Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah, we can do that. You want me to rewrite this line? Yes, I can do that. OK, so we said by the well-ordering principle, S has a smallest member. And we know that M is not equal to 1 since by A, P of 1 is true. So M is bigger than 1. This is what we had concluded. OK, 
m is bigger than 1, that means m minus 1 is a natural number, right? If m was equal to 1, m minus 1 would be 0, and we're only looking at things bigger than 1. But m is bigger than 1. That means m minus 1 is bigger than 0, right? This is a positive natural number, right? m is a positive whole number. Sorry, m minus 1 is a positive whole number. Does m minus 1 live in this set? Do you think yes? Why? It would follow from b. It would follow from b. OK. Any other answers to does m minus 1 live in this set? No. Why no? Because m is the smallest, exactly. Right? So we assumed m is the smallest number that lives in this set. That means m minus 1 doesn't live in here. So you're all, you guys are already finding the tension here. So since m minus 1 is less than m, which is the smallest member, of s, that implies that m minus 1 does not live in the set. Okay, so our truth claim has to be true for m minus 1. Right? M minus 1 does not live in the set. It's not a member of the people where p is false, so it must be true. So p of m minus 1 is true. We're trying to find a contradiction. What are we trying to affirm that goes against the other two? So all we're trying to do is find some way of coming up with a contradiction here. right? We started by assuming the conclusion was false, and we're trying to show that that's ridiculous for the conclusion to be false. So P of M minus 1 is true because it doesn't exist in the set? Because it doesn't exist in this set. P of M minus 1 is true because M minus 1 does not live in this set. right? If, if, M, min if M minus 1 was false, if p of m minus 1 was false, it would have to live in this set, because that's how we've defined the set. Right? So since it doesn't live in this set, it must be true. Uh, so is it Zachary? What was the problem you were seeing here? You were pointing it out a second ago. Uh, we have the, these and implications, like this is the result of the implications false, so the first term had to be false. Right. So what you were seeing was part b. Part b said that if, it's, if this statement is true for any value, then it's true for the next value, right? So by b, since p of m minus 1 is true, now we've assumed any time p is true for a number, it's true for the next number. right? That means p of m minus 1 plus 1 is true. That's what, that's what hypothesis b says. If p is true at one point, it's true at the next point. right? m minus 1 is going to knock down the next domino. And this is a problem, right? Because if p of m is true, p of m is true, then m must not live in this set, right? And that's a problem because we said m does live in this set. So this means, can I go lower on this board or no? Yeah, yeah? OK. It's just the podium in the way there. OK, so this means that m does not live in s, even though we know that m lives in s. We said that, where did I write it here? M is the smallest member of S. It lives in S. So this is a contradiction. And that was the goal. This is how proof by contradiction works, right? We start by saying, we assume all our hypotheses are true. We assume the conclusion is false. And then we discover that it's absurd for the conclusion to be false, right? The laws of logic don't allow the conclusion to be false because we reach a contradiction. Okay, so here's our contradiction. And that means by, uh, by proof by contradiction, we must have made a bad assumption here. Actually, the conclusion has to be true. So we're going to assume, not assume, we're going to conclude that 
Okay, the three dots, that's the therefore. P of n is in fact true for all n. Any questions on that? Okay, so that's the basics of mathematical induction. This is why it works. Now, the other part is we've got to see how it works. Let's put it into practice and see how do we do this in, in, in general. How do we prove that part A and part B work for a particular truth claim? Okay, so that's mainly what we're going to do the rest of the class is look at some examples of how this works. I get a little practice with this, and then you'll get to do a little bit more practice in the homework. Yes. Um, n is a field, right? And the elements of that field are defined by. So we're not assuming that n is a field, right? Uh, n is just a set of positive whole numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's a set within the field. It is a subset of a field, sure. Okay. And the elements of that field. Are but, now remember, if we're only looking at the natural numbers, we don't have division, right? We don't have a multiplicative inverse. Okay. Right? right. So again, n is not a field. All right, let's do an example. I wrote down this example before, so let's try to prove it now. Uh, 1 plus 2 plus n. I think it was Gauss as a young child. The school teacher was trying to just keep the kids distracted for a while, right, because, I don't know, she wanted some alone time or quiet. Uh, so she told her students, I don't know, seven, eight years old, to add up the first 100 numbers and figured that would keep them busy for a little while and she could, whatever, take a nap. Uh, unfortunately, Gauss almost immediately came up to the front of the room and handed her a solution with the correct answer to it. And that's because he'd noticed this trick that you don't really have to add up the first 100 numbers. Uh, you just have to do a quick multiplication and you're there. OK, so let's see why this works. We want to prove this is true. We're going to try to prove this by induction. So that means we have to do two things. The base step. The base step, most of the time, is a fairly simple step. Usually it's the induction step where the work gets done. So for the base step, we just have to plug in n equals 1 and see if this works. OK, so let's check for n equals 1. So we plug n equals 1 in here. And we get the claim that the first one numbers, so that's just 1, is equal to 1 half times 1 times 1 plus 1. That looks OK to me. Looks OK to you? Yep, OK. So base step is done. Most of the time, it's that easy. All right, so the induction step. The induction step is where we have to do a little bit more work. OK, so I'm going to assume for some generic value, this works. So we assume p of k is true. OK, that is for some particular value of k, 1 plus 2 up to k equals 1 half k, k plus 1. OK, and then secondly, um, we want to try to show that now p of k plus 1 is true. So we want to show this works. For k plus 1, for n equals k plus 1, next value. So a typical approach here is to just start with the left-hand side. So start with the left-hand side of this, where n equals k plus 1 and manipulate and see if we can get it to look like the right-hand side, where n is replaced with k plus 1. Sometimes you'll start with the right-hand side and work your way to the left-hand side, whichever is easier. OK, so what do we want to start with? The left-hand side of that statement is going to be 1 plus 2. And we have to go all the way up to k plus 1.
So there's two big things to keep in, in mind here. Right? One is that we've got to plug n equals k plus 1 in here and, work, and try to make that work out. Again, usually you'd <coughs> plug it into the left-hand side and manipulate, or plug it into the right-hand side and manipulate. Secondly, we want to feed this assumption in somewhere. Right? This assumption should help us get there. So how can I feed that in here? Right, so 1 to k, these first terms, are going to be equal to 1 half k, k plus 1. And then I just have this bit left over. Since p of k is true. That's a simpler expression, right? It doesn't have an arbitrarily number of terms in it. It just has a couple terms, and we should be able to simplify this. So one obvious way we could simplify this is to try to factor out the k plus 1. Yes? OK, so I'm going to try to factor out the k plus 1. So I have k plus 1 times 1 half k plus 1. OK, so we simplify where we can, and we also try to work towards our goal. Our goal is to get something that looks like this, with a k plus 1, k plus 1 plus 1. And we should have a half out in front. We want a half out in front, so it makes sense to try to pull this half out in front. Okay? This isn't being try trying to be tricky. It's just looking at our goal and trying to work towards our goal. So I'm going to pull the half out. So this k plus 1 stays the same. I pulled the half out here. So I get a k plus 2. This is looking pretty good, right? We're trying to get this claim with n equals k plus 1 here. And it looks like we may have it. I'll write it out in one more step just to make it really clear. So k plus 1 and then k plus 1 plus 1. Right, and this, this is exactly what we wanted. We wanted, okay, we started with the left-hand side when we went up to k plus 1. Now we've got precisely the right-hand side, half k plus 1, k plus 1 plus 1. Right, so indeed, this is our right-hand side. And we can say, great, p of k plus 1 is indeed true. Any questions on that? Happy with the induction step? OK, and that's it. That's the whole proof by induction, right? We can now say, therefore, p of n is true for all n, right? Infinitely many values. I could plug, plug n equal to a Googleplex in here, which you're never going to finish doing this sum in your lifetime. But you could get a nice kind of closed expression for it using this formula. And, and be confident that this will work. We happy with this example? Yes? OK. Let's try another one. OK, so for example, we could try to prove that 7n, so 7 to the nth power minus 4 to the nth power is always a multiple of 3. OK, now again, no matter what value of n we plug in here.
Now that, I don't think that's completely obvious. It's obvious when n equals 1, right? Because you can do the subtraction really quickly. But for large values of n, it take you a while to work that out. So let's try to prove it. So step 1, step 1 is my base step. So my base step, I check for n equals 1. So I look at this, 7 to the 1th power minus 4 to the 1th power. That's equal to 3, and of course 3 is a multiple of 3. So that step is good. OK, so then the fun part is always the induction step. This is where we have to do a little bit of work. So again, we're going to start by assuming that for some particular value, n equals k, this thing works. So I'm going to assume that 7 to the k minus 4 to the k, we want to assume that this is a multiple of 3. So I'm going to write this down in sort of precise language. That means it can be written as 3 times some whole number right? for some value of m. OK, now we got to try to bootstrap our way up to what happens when we replace k with k plus 1. OK, so now let's look at this term. 7 to the k plus 1 minus 4 to the k plus 1. OK, here I can't just instantly substitute in this formula like we did on the last example. We have to do a little bit of work there. But we know we have a goal. We know we want to be able to substitute in this formula. right? So we know we should try to manipulate this to make terms like 7 to the k appear and make terms like 4 to the k appear. right? Because we know we want to use this assumption. So that's always your goal when you're doing induction is to you know, write down your left-hand side or your right-hand side of your goal and try to make it look something like this assumption so that you can plug it in. So that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to factor out a 7 to start with and say, I know I need a 7 to the k to appear. So let's factor out a 7. Now that term isn't exactly what I want, but it's getting closer. What I really want is a 7 to the k minus 4 to the k. Um, so another great trick that you can always do in math is you can Subtract a term, and then add the term back on, and you've changed nothing. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just subtract the term I want on. I'm going to say, what I really want here is 7 to the k minus 4 to the k. I've got to leave things unchanged, so I'd better add this 4 to the k back on. And we'll keep that guy there. OK, so this is good. We know now that this term is equal to 3m. right? That's our assumption. We did the work of making this look like our assumption. So we're going to write this as 7 times 3m. Then what's left? 7 times 4 to the k minus 4 to the k plus 1. I'll do the same trick that I did before and factor out a 4. And this works, again, since p of k is true. And again, now at this point, typically once we've been able to plug in this assumption, our assumption that p of k is true, usually that will simplify things a lot. Right? So now we have something that's looking a lot easier to manipulate.
Okay, so let's keep that 7 times 3m. Uh, there's this 4k, 4 to the k, floating around through here. We could factor that out. So I have plus 7 minus 4 times 4 to the k. Right, or just trying to simplify this down a little bit more, plus 3 times 4 to the k. And where do I want to go from here? What's my goal? I want to factor out the 3, exactly. We're trying to say that this can be written as a multiple of 3. So that means somewhere along the way I need to factor out a 3. And now it looks like we're in business to be able to do that. So I'm going to pull out this 3. And what do I have? I have a 7m here. I have a 4 to the k here. And this, this is exactly what we want. This now says we've taken this expression on the left-hand side, and we've, in fact, shown that it can be written as 3 times some whole number. right? So this is, indeed, a multiple of 3. Just because we've got a 3 factored out. And this is a whole number, right? right. If I had fractions in here, then then no. But because I have 3 times a natural number, it's a multiple of 3. That's what it means for something to be a multiple of 3. And then we're done. That's the induction step, right? So the induction step is a little bit more work. It was a little bit more work here than on the last example. Um, it won't always be obvious in the first step how to plug in this assumption. But again, you're working towards a goal. You know what the key things are that you need to do. You need to start with one side of your equation. You need to make it look like something where you can feed in the assumption. And then once you've fed in the assumption, you need to keep manipulating it and try to work it towards the conclusion. Right? So you, you have a big goal of proving a theorem, but you have little miniature goals along the way to help guide you so that it's not a big, overwhelming task. So this is it. This means that, indeed, 7 to the n minus 4 to the n is always a multiple of 3. Questions on that example? When I add it, it's called adding and subtracting the same thing. I don't know. <laughs> There's not a fancy term for it. But yeah, it's a very, very common trick is you add zero to your equation, which doesn't change anything, right? That was actually one of our axioms from last class that you can always add zero to equation. The trick is finding a way to write zero in a very clever, tricky way. And that's not always obvious. I'm going to keep complaining about the number of seats in this room. I did complain. I will complain again. OK, so now we've done a couple examples. Things work. It looks simple. Uh, now I want to do another sort of example and just to remind you to exercise a little bit of caution whenever you're doing this and make sure that the assumptions really hold. OK, so this is, I'm going to call this a theorem. This is not a true theorem, but we're going to try to use mathematical induction to prove it and then see if we can spot the hole in the proof. So here is my pseudo theorem. So for all natural numbers, let p of n be this statement. OK, this is not a super mathematical looking statement, but we're going to try to prove it mathematically anyways. So in any collection of n marbles, all marbles are the same color. OK, so P of 12 says, you give me any 12 marbles you like out of the whole world, they're guaranteed to all be the same color. Probably you're experiencing a little bit of skepticism towards this uh, statement.
statement at this point. Um, and this is where I want to show you how you can do something that looks like a reasonable math proof by mathematical induction, uh, and there's subtle errors that can creep in. So we want to be on the alert for subtle errors. OK, so here's the base step. P of 1 is the statement that in any collection of one marble, all the marbles are the same color. We believe this. Yeah, I believe this. So P of 1 is clearly true. OK, the induction step. So in the induction step, we're going to assume P of k is true. That is, every time we have k marbles, they're all the same color. Okay, so we have. k marbles are guaranteed to be the same color. Now we need to look at p of k plus 1. So let's look at p of k plus 1. OK, so we have a collection k plus 1 marbles. And we want to show they're all the same color. OK, so I'm going to do this in a couple steps. I'm going to start by ignoring the last marble and just look at this. Here, I am sort of throw out the last marble for the moment. So let's ignore the last marble. The remaining ones, the first k marbles, right? If I throw out this one, what am I left with? I'm left with a connection of k marbles. They must all be the same color because p of k is true. Okay, so let's call this color. C1. Okay, I'm going to play the same game. This time I'm going to throw out the first marble and bring the last one back in. So now we ignore. The first marble, and we know that the last k are all the same color. Right. In the meantime, the guys in the middle have not swapped colors on us. These are constant color marbles. They don't, they're not like chameleons or camouflaging or anything. They haven't changed on us. How do I know that the last ones are the same color? Right, Because we've assumed that this statement P of k is true. Every time you have a set of k marbles, they're all the same color. Right? So we're assuming that's true right? and trying to use it to say, if this is true, right? it might not be true, but if it's true, we want to show that P of k plus 1 is true. That's what the induction step does. The induction step doesn't say, yes, p of k is true. It just says, what would happen if it was true? And if it was true, it means I can throw out one and everything that's left. Now there's only k of them. They have to be the same color because of this statement that we've assumed is true. All right. The middle guys haven't changed colors in the meantime. So 
So we must have that those two colors are the same. So C1 is C2, right? If the middle marbles were C1 by our first argument, they were C2 by our second argument, these are the same. And that means, in fact, the entire collection of k plus 1 marbles all have the color C1. And that's your induction step. That means P of k plus 1 is true. So have I convinced you? If I pull 18 marbles out of my pocket, they're guaranteed to be the same color. Or if I ask you to each give me any marble of the you're choosing, they're all guaranteed to be the same color. The, the induction step only works for k greater than or equal to 2. And that's the subtlety that I want to point out here, right? Edge cases. Edge, you run into edge cases a lot as a mathematician. Or if you have any computer programming experience, you'll know that edge cases are a nightmare. And this is what's going on here. So this is my warning, is that when you're doing these steps, that's right. If I, so if I started by assuming p of 1 is true, right? And then I say I want to show p of 2 is true, I can't because I don't have any middle marbles, right, that overlapped. Once I have two marbles, I try to show that p of 3 is true, it's fine. I'm going to have a middle marble that overlaps. But that's exactly what's going on here. So this is the problem. This is, of course, not a true theorem. Yes. Yes. But the proof looks OK. Why do I need the middle marble? I needed the middle marble to show that these two colors were the same. Right? So if I, let me, um, I'll write this out in more detail. Why doesn't this work? So here's the problem. The induction step only works if k is greater than 1. Right? What happens if k is equal to 1? Okay, So any collection of one marble is the same color as itself, which is true. Now look at p of k plus 1, which is p of 2. Right? So I said, let's start by ignoring the last marble or the first marble. Right? And we concluded this has color c1. Then we ignored it, and we said, all of these are the same color. That we'll call that C2. There's no relation. But there's no relation between connection between them. There's no reason here these have to be the same. And it should work for k greater than or equal to 2. It should work for k right, greater than or equal to 2. So what you're saying is I have nothing, uh, no object to relate the two. I have no way of relating the two, exactly. So what we've shown is that if we were to able to knock down domino number 2, domino number 3 would fall. If we could knock down domino 3, domino 4 would fall. That would all work. We've shown that we can knock down domino 1, but domino 1 falls short of domino 2 and never hits domino number 2. And that's the problem, and it's the subtlety here. Right? So we can't conclude here. Let me rewrite this. We can't conclude that C1 equal C2 since there's no overlap. So what do, what do we know? We know P of 1 is true. We know that P of 2 implies P of 3, that P of 3 implies P of 4, Oops. and so on. Right, ad infinitum. But there's a, there's a missing step here, right? So we can never actually show that p of 2 is true. Only if it was true, p of 3 would be true. So the induction method uh, relies on a relationship between the 
the reduction relies on a, the induction relies on a relationship between them. So that's something in some of the more subtle problems that will come up sometimes that if you're trying to show PK implies P of K plus one, maybe you have an inequality relationship between them. Maybe it only works for n greater than or equal to four, for example. And these are things that you have to be careful of. What are the edge cases? Where does this actually kick in and start to be true? So here's the warning. Watch out for the edges. Okay, so that's an example of induction done wrong. I, I won't usually give examples of things done wrong, but it's, it's helpful sometimes to put out warnings of things that you will be tempted to do. Not for an example like this, right? This was patently a ridiculous claim. Um, but there'll be other claims that you're going to see that it's not utterly obvious if they're true or not, and, and you can make this mistake in very subtle ways. So be on guard. OK, we can modify induction a little bit. So sometimes a claim won't be true. We got a hint of this here. It won't be true for n equal 1 or n equals 2. Maybe n has to be big enough before it kicks in. And that's OK. And we can still use mathematical induction for that. So as another example, we could make the claim that 4 times n is less than 2 to the n, which is not always true. right? Plug n equals 1 in there, it's not true. So what I'm going to claim is that this doesn't work for all values of n, but that this works for all n bigger than or equal to 5. OK, so mathematical induction is going to work almost the same here. The only difference is that our base step now is not to show that p of 1 is true, it's, it's not, but to show that p of 5 is true. So here our base step means we need to check n equals 5. Okay, So if we put in n equals 5, we have 4 times 5 is less than 2 to the fifth. Or in other words, 20 is less than 32. That looks good. So p of 5 is true. OK, and then secondly, we need to show that we have our induction step. If p of k is true, then p of k plus 1 is true. Um, and again, it doesn't matter really if that works for k equals 1 or k equals 2, as long as it kicks in to be true when n is greater than or equal to 5. So our induction step is, is to check that p of k being true implies p of k plus 1 is true for all k at least greater than or equal to 5. It doesn't really matter what happens when k equals 1, 2, 3, or 4. This might work or it might not. OK, so let's assume p of k is true. So we're going to assume that 4k is less than 2 to the k. OK, and again, we want to now go back and try to do this again, where n is replaced by k plus 1. So I'm going to start on the left-hand side. So now I'll look at n equals k plus 1. The left-hand side is 4 times k plus 1. OK, we know the first thing we're always trying to do is to manipulate this to the point where we can feed in our assumption. So we better multiply this out to get this 4k on its own.
Okay, and then we can feed in our assumption, right? This term here, this first part is less than 2 to the k. Yes? Yes. So this is less than 2 to the k plus 4. All right, this doesn't look yet like what we want, right? We want a 2 to the k plus 1, and we ain't got that yet. So again, we've got to do some manipulations to try to make it look like this. So I know I want a 2 to the k plus 1. That is, I want 2 times 2 to the k. So here I have 1, 2 to the k. I need a second 2 to the k to show up somewhere, right? So I'm going to try to manipulate it again towards my goal, that I need a another 2 to the k to show up. I need two of them. So what do I have here? Let me rewrite this a little bit. This is plus 2 squared. Is that less than 2 to the k or greater than 2 to the k or neither or both? It's less than 2 to the k, right? It wouldn't be if n was equal to 1, but n is not equal to 1, right? We've already excluded that possibility. For k greater than or equal to 5, it certainly is true. So this is certainly true that this is less than 2 to the k plus 2 to the k since k is bigger than or equal to 5, which is indeed bigger than 2. Right? So this is another example of the kind of thing where you should worry about edge cases. This won't always be true, uh, but it's true where we need it to be true. And now we're in business. Now we have two copies of 2 to the k. In other words, we have 2 times 2 to the k is indeed 2 to the k plus 1. Okay, so we look back through here. Here I've got my left-hand side. Here I've got my right-hand side. And the connections are all through either equal signs or inequalities that are going the correct direction. Right? They're all lessons. So this is what we want. So therefore, we can say that indeed If I take out the middle steps, that indeed 4 times k plus 1 is less than 2 to the k plus 1, and p of k plus 1 is true. Right? And that's our induction step. Right? So again, the induction step is the trickier part. It will look a little bit different every time you do it, but you have the same principles in mind. Right? Start with our left-hand side or right-hand side, whichever looks easier to work with. Manipulate it till you can feed in your assumption that p of k is true, and then keep trying to manipulate it towards the conclusion that you know you want. Right? Those are our many steps. So therefore, we can conclude now by induction that 4n is less than 2 to the n as long as n is big enough. Yes? How did I get 2 to the k plus 2 to the k? So the way I got that was to say 2 squared is less than 2 to the k, right? Because k is bigger than 2. Those three dots being, um, being therefore. Any other questions on this example? Okay, I think we have time for one more. So let's do something with factorials. So you guys know what the factorials are, right? Zero factorial is typically defined to be 1. n factorial is the product of the first n integers. And here's what we want to prove. This is my claim P of n. P of n is the claim that the sum from 1 to n of i minus 1 divided by i factorial is equal to n factorial minus 1 divided by n factorial.
Okay, same two steps that we always have. We start with the base step. So our base step says that we have to try to plug in n equals 1. So if I plug in n equals 1, what happens? I have a sum from 1 to 1, so it's just the first term. Right? So I'm going to plug in 1 minus 1 over 1 factorial, which is 0. And indeed, that's equal to this guy right here. That's the same as 1 factorial minus 1 over 1 factorial. So the base step we can certainly verify works. OK, then the fun part. The fun part is the induction step. OK, so for the induction step, we're going to assume that, we always do, we're going to assume that the sum of the first k terms is equal to k factorial minus 1 over k factorial. All right, and now what we've got to try to do is see what happens to this sum when we replace n now with k plus 1. Okay, so let's look at p of k plus 1. So what's on the left-hand side? The left-hand side, I just replace the n with a k plus 1. All right, how am I going to simplify this? Put the sum up, right? We know that we want to use this fact, the sum of that we know something about the sum of the first k terms. So let's split it up. i equals 1 to k, of i minus 1 over i factorial. And we left out the last term, so we've got to include the last term. k plus 1 minus 1 over k plus 1 factorial. OK, we did that for a reason, right? We did it because we want to bring in our assumption. We know p of k is true. So now we have a nice simple expression for this that is not going to involve this sum notation. Okay, So if I were move over here, we know that the first bit of it is equal to k factorial minus 1 over k factorial. And what's left? k over k plus 1 factorial. OK, where do I go from here? <coughs> the denominator, exactly, right? So here, this is equal to k plus 1 times k factorial, right? We need to multiply and divide this term by k plus 1 to bring it over a common denominator. So I'm going to have k plus 1 times k factorial minus 1 plus k all over k plus 1 factorial. OK, and then I'm going to multiply it out, right? When you get to a place where there's obvious simplification steps to be done, then most of the time it's worth doing them. So we can multiply this out. k plus 1 times k factorial. That gives me a k plus 1 factorial. And then k plus 1 times 1. All over k plus 1 factorial.
So let's see if this is going where we want. What do we want? We're hoping to get the n replaced by a k plus 1. So we need a k plus 1 factorial term here. We need a k plus 1 factorial in the denominator. And what we'd like is a minus 1 here. And as luck would have it, if we simplify this, we get our minus 1 coming up, right? Minus k plus k, those go away. So indeed, I have k plus 1 factorial minus 1 over k plus 1 factorial. Right? And that is exactly the thing that we want to get on the right-hand side. I've taken my right-hand side and replaced the ends by k plus 1. So we have, indeed, p of k plus 1 is true. Right? That's your induction step. We proved our base step. So that's the whole proof. Now we know that we can always work out this sum exactly. Okay, so therefore, p of n is true for all n. Yes? You just have to show that they're equal. So if you manipulate both sides somehow. You can manipulate both sides, absolutely. Correct. As long as you can make them meet in the middle. So start wherever is easier. Sometimes it's easier to start on the right. Sometimes it's easier to start on the left. Sometimes it's easier to play with both and make them meet in the middle. When you write out your final solutions, you, know, you want to write it out in a way that's clear and easy to follow and not where I have to read you know, from the bottom of the page up to make sense of things. But when you're actually working things out in practice, yeah, you will work from both sides. And they just have to be equal, yeah. And again, some examples it will be easier to start on the right-hand side. By using a method of induction, yes. we never know, we, we know the conclusion in these examples before we make Yes. But in real life problem, you don't know. In real life problem, yeah. So you have to invoke the contradiction. Um, real life is much harder than uh, <laughs> textbook life. So I'll say in real life, you have a th might have a theorem that you want to prove. Um, I've spent months trying to prove results that ended up being false. And that happens, right? So real life is harder. Um, you do some experiments. You know What you would do is you might work this out for the first few terms, and you see a pattern and say, I wonder if this is always true, and you try to prove it. Um, so real life is certainly more complicated than textbook life, but these are the kinds of techniques we use. Um, and since you don't have months and months to try to guess at what the thing is you want to prove, I'm going to help you out most of the time and tell you what you want to prove, and let you use the techniques.